Okay, um, good evening, colleagues, and thank you for joining um, the COVID champions uh, update this evening. Uh, as I said, Dr. Madupe Omaniji will be joining us shortly. Um, just usual housekeeping, please keep our mics on mute. Do use the chat box for questions or comments or to indicate you'd like to voice a question. You can also use the hands up icon to indicate you'd like to voice a question. The call is being recorded for minutes purposes only and will be shared with uh, champions, with the champions and that the agenda is in the group chat. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll start off by, uh, we haven't got the latest figures, unfortunately. They were due to be, come out today. They haven't been released um, for authenticity reasons. They haven't been checked properly or verified. Um, but I'm gonna share last week's um, data that we've got. Data which is up until, I think it's the end, nine, weekend in 19th, I think it is. So if I share my screen, just put it in one second. Hopefully everybody can see that. Can everybody see that? Somebody just lets me know that they can see it or not. Yes, I can see that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, for, the, for those of you who are familiar uh, with, the, uh, with the dashboard, um, it also goes out in the newsletter. Unfortunately, as I said, the dashboard wasn't in um, today's edition of the newsletter simply because we're just waiting to get it verified. Um, we wasn't able to verify the figures uh, to ensure that they're accurate. So the dashboard, we will send out the dashboard separately to the champions tomorrow. Normally we do send it out uh, with, with the newsletter, but it didn't go in, the, in this today's edition of the newsletter. Um, as, as you can see, um, new cases and overall case rates have decreased in the last seven days up to the 19th of September. Uh, as you can see there, um, last week it was 3,124 cases, uh, new cases per 100,000. That's dropped quite significantly to 2,712. Uh, that's positive tests and the rate of cases again, um, overall uh, this week, again, it's dropped. Uh, last week is 273 and this week is 237. Rate of testing uh, has increased as well. You know, that, a lot of that's probably to do with schools reopening as well. Um, last week was about 7,263. This week, sorry, 7,000. And 2063, last week, uh, 9,580. Um, which, is, which, which, which is good. Um, as a representative, PCR test has also decreased along with all overall testing ratings using PCR, both PCR and LFT tests. Um, again, as per usual, mm -hmm. we do encourage um, all adults to regularly uh, test at home using the, the rapid lateral flow tests. Um, and the test kits are available at many community sites now across the city, your local pharmacies. You can also apply for them free by post. Um, um, a lot of the spread in terms of the, 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 the virus itself is primarily um, occurring through households and household mixing. Uh, and social and, and, and workplace. Obviously, as things open up and more and more people are going out and socializing, the risk of spread is higher. That's why we encourage people before they go out to actually test or before they do an activity to test at least twice a week if you can. Um, hospitalizations across the city admission range is between 25, 24 and 49 new cases a day. Uh, then weekend in 19th of September, we had total 221, that's a decrease of 13% when compared to last week's admission, which was between 21 and 57. There were 15 deaths reported last week, an increase of four deaths compared to the previous week. So the previous week had 11, uh, the week before that, sorry, uh, we ended in the 12th and last week um, we had 15. Just move on to the next slide. The case rates per ward, um, as you can see, 10 wards are the highest case rates per 100,000, with Yardley being the, the highest, 409, and then Quinton being in 10th uh, with 348. Uh, the actual color code in the actual map has changed a little bit. Previously, I think the darker shaded colors were the highest rates. Now it's um, the lighter shaded colors, so the white shaded colors, as you can see, 
while they're green there to the south of the city and Bourneville and you got areas like Sheldon to the to the west of the city to the east of the city sorry uh, that are got that are higher 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 um, case rates uh, cases have de decreased in all age groups this week with the largest decrease in the 20 to 39 age group now that doesn't mean that it doesn't definitely mean that cases are low it just could mean that could mean either either it could mean that the cases are genuinely low or that age group isn't testing uh, and within um, the demographics, cases have decreased in all ethnic groups, with the largest decrease in the mixed and other ethnic group. These are just case rates by all, all of the wards in, 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 in Birmingham. I'll skip that, just go to the vaccine. Again, with, in terms of the vaccine uptake, as you can see, um, the NHS and social care, uh, work, care workers Vaccine has has increased. Um, you know, we we come to the deadline of November where NHS and social care workers need to be vac fully vaccinated. So almost eighty percent of people have got have got both doses, um, and there's about eighty five percent that have got the first dose. We're still, in terms of the eighteen to thirty nine um, age group, um, we're still really quite low compared to um, the city's average and, and, and the national average with just about 18 to 29, just under 50% of people have received the first dose and about just under 40% have received both the first and second dose. Uh, the, the kind of vulnerable age category group where we, we're doing really well in terms of the, the, 70, the 70 plus the 70 to 79, age group, you can see, you know, above 90% of people have received both the first, well, both the, the first vaccine, or almost, most of them all have almost got the second dose as well. If I move on to the next slide, again, vaccination uptake by ward, this hasn't changed for a, for a, for a long, long time now. You can see the ward with the, um, the lowest vaccine uptake, uh, Start off Newtown. Oops, sorry. Yeah, Newtown with 43%. Hollyhead, Allen Rock, Neutrals, Birchfield, Bosley. I'm not going to read all of them, but you know, a lot, a lot of the areas are kind of like tend to be uh, the inner city of West or Western Central um, of, of Birmingham. That's got the high. That's got the uh, the lowest of the vaccine uptake. Okay, so that ends the slides. Whilst we're still waiting for uh, Madhya Pay to arrive, has anybody got any questions or queries that they'd like to raise as regards the slide set we just shared or the information of the data? As I said, up-to-date data, hopefully we'll be sharing that with you tomorrow. This is up to week ending uh, the 19th of September. I'll take any questions. Hi. Sorry, do we, is it okay to ask here? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, sorry. So I'm, my, I'm Jebba, and I've just recently joined this COVID update and everything. Mm -hmm. So I I myself live in Sheldon. I am fully vaccinated. I'm double vaccinated. And everything. Mm -hmm. So I am kind of concerned that the area that I live in is one of the places that are raising COVID cases. What can we do to raise awareness? What can I do to bring the community and to engage with the um, demographically engage with the people of the area to get vaccinated or to kill why and find out why why there is a COVID rate um, rise and everything. Sure, sure. I mean that, that that that's a that's a really that's a really good question, and I'm I'm really glad that you're asking what you could do to help us. I mean the, the ask is information that we share with you. Um, yeah. For you, for you to relay that information um, to the community or for the people in Sheldon into importance of of. Um, why why people you know need to be vaccinated you know what are the things that they need to do in terms of uh to try and stop the spread you know th things like if people are, are have are symptomatic or um are tested positive to stay at home to self-isolate they need to be aware of um, what the self-isolation guidance is uh uh if, if people have got issues and questions about vaccines or anything and you're unsure of by, by all means um get in touch and we can share resources and information with you that can better inform you to have those 
informal conversation informal conversations with people that may be asking questions to yourself or 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 raising any issues or concerns yeah sure i think my colleague um Noor Amin will also so we, we work together so we could um yeah well I'll yeah, have, that, we'll that, have that's, that's brilliant i mean i've got i've got Nurul share this share this information if likewise if you want to in the chat if you don't want yeah. everybody to see just privately message me no, that's fine yeah, yeah. Me, your contact details yeah. no it's fine i'm on yeah and then what, what, what I can do is outside of this meeting, we can um, have a conversation with yourself, both yourself and Nuru, and, and yeah. all the assets and resources that we've got that could better equip you to have those conversations in, the, in, in, in those areas. We'll share those with you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that now. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other questions from anybody? With the date or information? Abby, could you just clarify the, the two different groups of carers that are on that list? It said DWP carers and LA carers. Yeah. So let me just get, if I just get that list up again. I'm just looking at the list myself. Sorry, you got, uh, let me just screen share with you so everybody can see what we're talking about. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. Yeah, sure. That's great. Let me just. So, right. Okay. We... To the best of my knowledge, I mean, I'll, I'll wait. For, I'm, uh, Dr. Mudebe could answer that question probably better. What? To the best of my knowledge, um, local, obviously local authority carers, I'm assuming that those are carers that work directly for the local authority, uh, or, um, organizations that may be commissioned or, or funded by the local authority that supply carers. And the DW, I know what DW is, the Department of Work, Work and Pension, I don't know what that is. So I'll wait for Dr. Mudupe to answer that one. But I know the, the local authority one is organizations that are commissioned by adult social care to actually provide care, care, care provision and care services. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll wait to see. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. so, but the, like, like, the local authority one I know, the DWP one, I don't know, I don't know what, what, what that is. So we'll just wait for Dr. Mudupe to. Oh, oh, sorry, come. sorry. My husband works for DWP, so Department of Work and Pension, Pensions, yeah. which is funded by the government. Yeah. So it's funded by the government, and so we are looking on the people that are got, um, so nationally, not governmentally funded. Two different, there's two different I'm, I'm thinking, the yeah. I'm thinking whether that's yeah. yeah. I'm thinking whether that's carers that, but I'm I'm thinking whether that that could be carers that kind of like maybe somebody's a carer. That cares for their own. Oh, the deed, yeah, carers as well as you know from hospitals that um and then hosp um you know needs to go to. Oh God, I've gone blank now. Um, you know they go they have to go for that uh, the care after after medical they no longer yeah, yeah, can be safe. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, oh, sorry, there's a word for it. I've completely gone blank. And then there's um the support. council funded. Yeah, yeah. The local LA one is which assistance support, support is care assistance. Yeah. yeah. So those yeah. are the difference. There are the, the NHS funded and the social care work. Yeah. There's 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 two different yeah. sections there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The care is LA for the local authority. Local authority. Yeah. Carers. I'm aware of the local authority one, but I wasn't aware that the yeah. yeah, I know it's the part of work and pensions, but. As I said, yeah. that, that, that one probably is where people are caring for their own family members. That people, people as well do, as, yeah. People and, do get a carer's allowance from the allowance, DWP. Yeah. Yes, yeah, from DWP, yeah. Yeah, that's that, yeah. So I'm assuming that could be, that could be that class as a carer. In, in receiving get, carer's allowance. Yeah, people that are receiving a carer's allowance. And then the, the NHS one is the people that are actually employed, actually by the social care role by the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that children social workers come in there somewhere? People working in children social work, they were in the priority group as well. So they're either in the NHS and social care workers or carers local authority. But no, what's CEV? So, sorry, one second, sorry, I think. 
I've got to let me do pay. Just bear with me one second, sorry. I'll come back to this slide. I think me do pay has, I just want to double check to make sure that I've let the correct person in. I'm, I think me do pay has joined us. Me do pay here? Yes, I am. Oh. If it was me, you let in. Okay, sorry. I just, <laughs> sorry about to, I just want to make, I just want to make sure. I've, I've done the uh, the dashboard uh, up to 90. Brilliant. Just, Thank just, you. Just taking, just taking some questions. I think um, one of the callers on uh, asked, one of the champions asked uh, the difference between uh, LA care and a DWP care. I think we kind of, between us, resolved that, but I just want you to know, just you to clarify it, because what we said was the local authority carers are, are carers that are paid by maybe organizations or people that are commissioned by the local authority, uh, and, 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 and those carers, and the DWP ones are maybe people that get care allowance or, or family members, or looking after their own family members, brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents. Yeah, that that's, that's exactly what my understanding is mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, definitions of the two. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and then somebody asked. I'm sorry, about, I joined. No, that's fine. And in terms of the vaccine slide, uh, since you're here now, I don't want to undermine you. Uh, it says uh, on the vaccine update, uh, you've got it says CEV. What does acronym mm -hmm. CEV stand for? Ah, uh, the clinically extremely mm -hmm. vulnerable. Um, I think that acronym, uh, that particular uh, nom nomenclature or naming is changing as well. Actually, it's been changed. So that was, as we know, those groups of people who had letters from their GPs advising them that they should um, shield. You know, the shield, that, that was the word they were using yeah. from last year. Yeah, the shielding group. Now, because that uh, advice has now been lifted uh, as we've come out of lockdown, I think CEV or the clinically extremely vulnerable group will no longer exist is my understanding, but the slide still refers to that group, uh, but you might find that that will not be updated due course. Okay, thank you. There's a question in the group chat, Madhubai. Someone's asking, will both groups of carers have to be vaccinated by November deadline? So I'm assuming who, um, uh, Shabina, is that, are you referring to the uh, local authority carers and the DWP carers? or the NHS uh, social care staff? I'm referring to community um, carers, really, those who go out and um, provide care rather than in hospitals. Okay. Thank you. So the guidance says that those who work in care or who are volunteers, actually, that's what the guidance says. So not just staff, but also the volunteers. Um, my understanding is anybody who is classed as doing that will, will need to have the vaccine. So it doesn't matter whether you're the look under the local authority or DWP. But I think it gets difficult because if you're DWP, you're caring for a loved one, isn't it? Who lives with you? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, you're not you're not necessarily being paid as an employee. But I guess the question is whether the uh, allowance you're getting for the government for doing that gets taken away if you haven't got the vaccine. It's a really good question. And I must say, I haven't got a clear cut answer for that. Uh, it might be that uh, we, we can uh, perhaps ask that question. Uh, yeah, we can find out from our adult social care colleagues and they can clarify that for us. But I think for now, the guidance is about carers who work in a care setting who are doing that as part of their employment, I think. So it might, it might from what I can see, I get the sense it's not going to uh, affect those ones. But, that's also but it, my it's my understanding that peripatetic errors, those that go into people's homes and provide care are not required to be vaccinated. It will be a good idea if they were, but my understanding is that the legal requirement doesn't extend to them. I, I agree with Kerry actually that my understanding as well is that it's, it's residential care um, because we, we run a day service and we're, we're, we're currently not required to be vaccinated. Is that Kate? Hi Kate. Hi. 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 Well we can double check. I think it, it's the, the guidance itself as we know it's been long coming and there have been discussions about how it's going to be implemented. So um, the difficulty I guess is for those who for day centers although you, you offer care I think if you're not offering the uh, type of direct or personal care to the people who come along there, you might not fall under the category of 
those who work in care who are deemed to be more at risk because of offering close contact or direct care to uh, vulnerable people. That, that's my understanding uh, of it, but we can definitely double check. And uh, it's the kind of guidance that we're still seeking more clarity on. Even recently, we were told about a list of possible exemptions to vaccination, uh, which was shared with us. And uh, that guidance was being awaited in more detail because some people have challenged some of the exemptions on there and said that's not consistent with the rest of the a green book and the vaccination guidance we've received. So I, I'm just looking at the guidance now. So it, it oh, says, well. yeah, so it says that people who are deployed or working in care homes, so again, yeah, so if it's care homes, then I guess if you don't work in a care home, uh, yeah, care home workers uh, are the ones that the, the guidance currently refers to. So that that's a that's a bit more clarity then. Um, Benita has also put a, a comment up in the uh, in, in in the uh, in the group chat. Benita, you want to voice it? I think it'd be better if you voice it rather than me paraphrasing it. Hi, I think um, I think it's uh, the point that Madhupi's um, just clarified, which is the legislation doesn't appear to apply to domestic settings. Um, but the thing about residential homes, it's not just care workers, it is people doing the carpentry, mending the toilets, etc. as well. So it's quite it's it's quite heavy and, and uh, it'll be those extra people. And I think I think volunteering in a in a volunteering capacity I think also was in there um, but not not for visiting family members. Absolutely, Benita. Yep, you're right. I've just popped the actual wording in the guidance into the chat. It says it applies to all professionals and trades people who enter these settings as well. So, I mean, the, the reality is, um, I think, and again, if you read it, it says service providers, registered persons, local authority oh. workers, including agency staff, residents of CQC regulated care homes that provide accommodation for persons who require nursing and personal care. So uh, the difficulty is that it, it says care homes, but I'm just wondering if perhaps even the res, uh, residential settings like dom, um, housing with care and extra care settings might begin to be classed as part of that. I think for now, We've got till the 11th of November, so we have to just wait, wait and watch this space, I think, because the guidance will, will perhaps be updated again until we get the final version of it. I did ask the manager of um, Cherish House, which is next door to us. Hmm. It's, um, it's, not a, it's not a care home, but it's like, I'm not sure what you call it technically, but the people, it's kind of sheltered. So yeah. people have got their individual flats and then there's staff on site. Um, so I asked her, uh, the manager, if, if this affected, if this applied to them, and and, sh and she said yes. Yeah. So so even um, because I'm I'm not quite sure whether people, it, it, it's targeting that that housing is targeting mm -hmm. people who need higher levels of care, but they're not all necessarily actually receiving personal care. Yeah. But yeah. That's a, it's a really good point. So I, I think. Uh, there's so much to think about when it comes to this guidance and the impact it will have on the, those vulnerable people in, and the possible effect on, on them if we don't get more staff uh, vaccinated and if people choose not to carry on working in care homes. Um, uh, yeah. So I think it says care home for now. So we will we'll, we'll assume it only be care homes, but then anybody coming into that care home environment to carry out an activity, whether as a volunteer or staff, will need to be vaccinated or less their visitors. It looks like the visitors don't need to or they're exempt in any other way.
Ted, you unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? No, okay. What? No. Any? Sorry. That's fine. Um, any other questions? Could I just ask about um, sort of giving, getting some uh, resources um, out to parents, particularly those who um, children have recently been given a letter to take home to explain that, you know, it's up their decision to have the vaccine and not necessarily the parents. Parents are really quite upset about it, um, particularly 12 to 16 year olds. Um, and I suppose we just want to get the, the right right information. Oh, great, thank you. Oh, sorry, that's the care home one. So, well, uh, sorry, Shabina, which one did you want? Uh, some, some guidance and support really for parents or, um, who are, um, trying to have the answers for their teenagers on whether to have the vaccine or not. Um, they don't feel like they've had enough information. Thank you. That was actually discussed. I, I came a bit late because I was on the youth champions call uh, this evening and we, this was also discussed. So there are a couple of resources from the DHSC uh, and Public Health England, OXA that um, we can pop on that link, but we, we're also developing some local ones. Um, some uh, in collaboration with the CCG have already, already been signed off. I think, I'm not sure if the, all the videos are ready now. And we're trying to actually uh, do some, some um, videos with uh, some local schools showing some of the faces in the communities of people who are talking about their, their decisions about taking the vaccine and why they're taking it. And we know it's very difficult in some communities where people feel stigmatized for taking the vaccine, but where people feel confident or comfortable to do so, we're trying to do some awareness videos. So that's in progress, but we can definitely pop the generic PHE Department of Health on social care ones that have been shared with us. Uh, and some yes. of it has already gone out on social media as well, I think. I'll just put the link in the chat. Um, was All it, right, thank you. Was it Shabina that asked the question? I'll put the link in the chat from resource. Yeah. And, and also, as we go through the meeting, I'll, I've got some other links as well that I can put in the chat for you, Shabina. Yeah. So there's, there's quite a lot of uh, content that has been that's been developed. There's more, more. Th th some of the what. Uh, thank you, Habib. Habib's posted there. Um, some of it is generic, um, generic from uh, the center, from Department of Health, and other places. But we we are developing some local ones. I'm not sure if the videos that we, I'll see if I can send. There were some videos, um, Habib, that Stuart shared with us. Um, mm -hmm. And they would have gone into the champions newsletter. I'm really sorry you didn't receive that today. We had a bit of a delay with the um, dashboard. So you should get those in the morning. Can we make sure that the links for the uh, 12 to 15 vaccine resources yeah. also go on to the yeah, newsletter? It is, it is, it is in there. It's in there. I checked it. I it's checked in there. It. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. So you'll get all of them, Shabina. Thank you for raising that. Any other questions from anybody else? Yeah, sorry, it's me again as well. Yeah, so go again, for it. No, no, go for it. Go for it. Go for yeah. it. Don't be so, scared. It's um, the whole purpose of this, yeah. have these conversations. So I, yes. Yeah, so during last week, we were so between the three of us, Noral and myself and Parvin, we've been work, trying to work with the NHS Midlands and NHS National as well. And from that information, we've gathered that um, still uh, the uptake between the Bangladeshi community and the Pakistani community is still low. Um, and um, just like um, in the toolkit to recognise how low the East Birmingham and things like etc. So I understand that. But And this is why we wanted to get involved in a project where we can help and encourage um, individuals and the public to th consider the vaccination and thing. So how can this be achieved? And I think, because yes, I can get to the location, but how can we support, you know, support NHS in getting the vaccination, getting the message across regarding COVID vaccinations and also taking away all the myths and the things. And I'm sure you've all covered this, um, but 
yeah, the anti-vaxxers. And it's not just anti-vaxxers, it's also the fear. And where, we, where I'm located, we've had the influx of um, Afghanistani refugees as well who haven't been vaccinated due to the fact that there wasn't any vaccinations in their country and everything. So now they want it, but they're also very worried and concerned regarding all the things they've heard in Afghanistan, why not to take the vaccinations and things. Um, it's just a miscommunication, misunderstanding and things. So obviously we want to get involved in that sense and educate these people and give let them make a conscious decision whether they want to and make it their own decision, not be a conscious decision of somebody else. So how what could we do again? What could you know um, th what could we do as people that are pro vaccinators? So you are a vaccinator. How do you say your name again? I'm sorry. I missed Jebba. No, it's fine. It's Jebba. Jebba. Yeah. Jebba. Nice to have you on board, Jebba. Welcome. <laughs> and thank you for all that amazing work you're doing. It's really good insight you're giving us. So are you vaccinators yourselves? No, no, no. We're not vaccinators. Okay. Okay. No, we're so just, you're, um, you're part of the community. Yeah. Just trying to, yeah. yeah. So I think one of the things that we, we want to do is to try and really understand the the fair on the ground, what people are saying, what people are uh, hearing, uh, the information that might not be quite right that we can help to clarify and, and offer some uh, insight into. So what would really help is, you know, to get some of that information across to us. So for example, uh, uh, the other day, I think we had a meeting, didn't we Habib? And um, it was a faith meeting and and there were concerns about the efficacy of the vaccines and whether or not the vaccines really do what they say on the label. And so we had a really healthy discussion about it. And we plan to have more of that conversation just to reassure people that these vaccines are not different from any other vaccines, like the measles vaccine, for example. Uh, when you take the measles or the MMR vaccine, it doesn't necessarily uh, eradicate the risk of of getting measles, it reduces that risk by so much. And it, you don't just look at that risk reduction at individual level, it's at population level. So if that vaccine is shown to be 70% uh, effective at reducing the risk of measles, it means that where you have a population of about 100,000 people who could potentially die from measles, you would protect about 70,000 people and you might sadly have 30,000 die, but even at that, it could even prove to be much more effective than that. And so that was the sort of conversation we were having uh, on, on Monday with this faith uh, group. Uh, we talked about the fact that the COVID vaccines are the same and that people shouldn't get anxious about particularly misinformation, which because of the world we live in now with access to quick information and social media, oftentimes you, you, it's very hard for you to verify the credibility of a lot of information that you get uh, on WhatsApp uh, or, or from other means. And you'll get a lot of people who will say they are experts or, or have uh, certain specialisms uh, who will say to people, the vaccines can are not effective or they can cause you so much um, harm when in actual fact uh, the data may not have been validated properly. So we know at the moment that the vaccines we have do work but what we, we find is that where the vaccines do have failed so what we call vaccine failure which is a common uh, phenomenon not just for COVID vaccines but for any vaccine uh, sometimes people latch on to that and, and take that and focus on that more than the, the effectiveness of the vaccines and that can result in a lot of harm uh, and so we have to continue to listen to the concerns that uh, I think that people are raising but more, more most especially for us where your roles are so invaluable Jebba, is if you can give us some of the hard facts on the ground that people are sharing and these things that are really uh, creating anxiety and concern we can try and tackle those things one uh, one after the other oh yeah uh, because um, most yeah, definitely because... um uh, my colleague no he's always been all and parvin both and that's exactly what we've been exactly yeah. what we've been working on at this and this moment up until now we've been working on things like that but we just felt uh, only recently we've been told to put kind of put the brakes on it and everything because it's like dual it was you know a lot of other NHS central are also doing this uh, NHS Midlands are also doing campaigns and pop-ups and things at our universities and I think so we had like we had 
uh, dates, uh, freshest weeks dates uh, in where we could have gone in and everything, but obviously we didn't want to, be, we don't want to be given out incorrect information. And we also wanted to be briefed cor correctly. And yeah. at the same time, um, NHS Midlands were also going around with their, with their mini bus, with a bus, uh, with mm. COVID-19 uh, COVID bus and and having the ability where they not only do they are they able to educate also be able to vaccinate um at the same time and i think so that is a fantastic but obviously i didn't know and know about this until i came across the ccg and then speaking to then claire from nhs midlands um when I, that's when i found out so i mean there's yeah i mean it'd be great i think it'd be away from this conversation we could if we were to have another conversation and i could tell you the developments that's happened and everything that would be great. That'd Thank be you. Great. I think Habib has popped his email address. Yeah, he has. Yeah, and I've saved it as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I've already emailed, I've already emailed you, Bob Jebba and, and um, Yeah, tomorrow. I've got, I've got Thanks, your Habib. Yeah, I've saved you guys. Yeah. Nice. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. There's, a, um, there's a question in the group chat. Um, I'll answer it first because I'm, it's close to me. And then, Madiba, you want to take it? It is it's a real experience for me. So, Senator, if you don't mind mentioning it, Senator asks if the risk to teenagers is marginal. Uh, the general view is why have the vaccine and also is there any effect upon the heart for youngsters? So the heart for youngsters, I'll let Madhupa do that because she's a specialist, but in terms of my son is 15 as well, Sunita, he got his letter on Monday and over the week, sorry, on Friday, and his vaccination is tomorrow. So over the weekend, I was just pondering, and obviously I spoke to Madhupa, I spoke to my colleagues and I actually spoke to one of my GP colleagues uh, that actually, you know, is versed in vaccines. And what she said to me was that, have you get your son vaccinated? Although, yes, you know, the, the, the narrative is that risk to teenage is marginal. However, if you were to go into hospitals, you'll see there's a lot of younger people that are now hospitalized, particularly younger, non-white young people. Um, and, 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 and those young people, are, you know, the, the, the risk of them having long COVID is quite high as well. And, and if you don't want to, if you want to protect your child from that, then it's better to be vaccinated than that. And I know Medupe, daughter got vaccinated recently and then Medip, if you want to take the rest of the question. Thank you. She's 14 as well. And I think we had the same experience as Habib. We had to read a, a bit together, have a conversation about it, understand the pros and cons. Ah, and I think as parents, and I've only got the one, so you can imagine, I don't even have an option if anything happened to her. But I think I understand the anxiety, you know, that parents feel. And it's the worst time, I think, in the world to have so much uh, confusion as well, because people just want to get on with their day to day lives and then these complications coming. The reality is these vaccines are new. So like any new medication, we have to look at them carefully and tread with caution. And one of the things that we are very grateful for is that, you know, firstly, we leave in an advanced society, but more than anything also, we live in a society where as much as possible, people try and be transparent. And I know that hasn't felt that way in the last couple of sort of months and a year and a half because of some of the things that have gone wrong and decisions that have been made that haven't really looked uh, as clear cut as we would have liked them to be. So the information we know about the vaccine and inflammatory heart disease, I think has come from the initial uh, trials and studies and uh, the rollout of vaccines in places like Israel uh, where they were way ahead of everybody else in offering the vaccine to younger people and they noticed a pattern where uh, particularly in the young men where they'd had the vaccine they reported I think it was I don't remember if it was chest pain and then they noticed on oh, doing some ECGs and scans that these young men had a transient a short period of muscles of their heart uh, inflamed, but then it reversed uh, back to normal. So it, it was then seen as a potential very rare event. So just like the clotting, so they said, uh, of all the, those who had the vaccine, the proportion of those who had the inflammation was so minute or, or minimal that it wasn't significant enough for them to stop vaccinating uh, these young people. And they looked at the benefit of vaccination versus the harm and felt that it wasn't, you couldn't say that it was uh, unsafe and to stop vaccinating uh, these young men. Now the risk was higher in the men than the women and the young women. So the point is that for those who again worry about whether I've got a boy or a girl, 
uh, the reality is that it does is a very rare event and I've, I've got I've got the percentages in front of me I'm going to try and open up uh, my my slide now to see because it's a very rare event like the clotting event it doesn't tend to be that uh, you'll see that inflammation in every single young person who has the vaccine but for those who do have it it was a very short spell uh, and then it, the, the, the muscles went back to normal. And I know people worry about, so what's the longer if term effect? The, what, is there a possibility that this could, is going to create a long-term impact on their heart or their, or their health? So far, that has not been reported uh, for many of the studies. And we, in fact, the studies suggested that it wasn't on the first dose that that inflammatory effect was seen. It was on the second dose of the vaccine, which is why, uh, the, C the four nation CMOs, the chief medical officers, decided that we'd only give the young people the first dose, but not the second dose of the vaccine for now. And then wait, I guess they want to wait and see what then happens with the study. So there's there's a lot uh, to take in there around the safety. And I think from our assessment as professionals and personally, we didn't feel that that risk was significant enough. Uh, and particularly when I say significant, because it was this very small number. So it's a very rare event, but more importantly, if they're only giving them one dose, it didn't seem to matter much if, it's, if that effect was seen on the second dose. The other thing to bear uh, in mind as well is that it turned out actually that this uh, heart inflammation effect that you saw with the vaccines was also something that happened when you actually caught COVID-19 itself and the risk of that heart inflammatory heart uh, the muscle uh, effect from catching COVID-19 was far worse uh, than from the vaccine and that really made me think that Again, this people have said, where has this virus come from? You know, this virus is really horrible. They, what, what you see COVID doing to the human body, all the complications, including the long COVID that come from COVID, is far much more, it's far riskier and uh, far more uh, uh, of a hazard or a harm to the young people than taking the vaccine. Uh, you know, and we know as well that even drugs like paracetamol, if you go and look at your paracetamol packaging in your drug cupboard, if you've got paracetamol, if you read all the side possible side effects from paracetamol, I don't think how Paul and all those things we give the children, I don't think we'll ever give it to them again, uh, frankly. So I think there's a lot uh, to to think about. And I think more importantly, we just really need to, it's a bit like, what the CMO, the four nation CMOs, chief medical officers had to do with the JVCI advice. Based on what we know now, when we look at the evidence before us, if you put these two options on a scale, allow my child to get COVID and be exposed to all the complications from COVID or take the vaccine with a very rare uh, uh, event possible and from a, having the second dose of an inflammatory heart disease, I think I had to make that decision and I realized I'd rather have one dose of the vaccine uh, where I know that that risk is far less than the complications from COVID-19. So these are some of the some of the things that we are we have deliberated upon. And as we promised you, we'll continue to try as much as possible to offer you the information that we know uh, about the vaccines. We know that they've gone through loads and loads of trials and the children's trials started much earlier on, I think, before the announcements were even made. Uh, no point in time have we been told that any child has suffered long-term uh, effects from taking the COVID vaccine. So I think from our perspective, they are safe uh, for children uh, of the age group 12 to 15 that they've been offered to. And we will continue to encourage any parents to just keep having the conversations uh, with the children and reassure yourselves uh, by using credible information from trusted sources. Thank, thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you for waiting patiently. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just want to make a comment. I'm a retired paediatrician. I'm actually a vaccinator, and I'm one of the team of um, senior, uh, senior paediatricians who are on the advice line to the school um, vaccination programme, telephone advice line. So I think... I've read up about the information and it's not just 
the risks benefits ratio is very different in adults it's severe disease long covid versus uh, uh, in terms of the benefits of the vaccine in children the severe disease isn't an issue long covid is it reduces your chances by half but the main issue and the reason why the um, CMOs gave a different opinion from the um, JCVI is the overall effect on the child. So the huge um, disadvantages to children when they were out of school, issues on mental health in, in children, which is a big problem. Um, and, and that's the benefit. The benefit is much wider than the actual preventing COVID disease. And, and I think that's one of the... Um, the things that has to be sort of considered with young people when they are uh, making the decision. I mean, the difficulty is going to be that the child or the young person aged 12 upwards is likely to be considered Gillick competent to make that decision for themselves. So what they decide is what happens. The parents may disagree um, and don't uh, necessarily um, have, ha the legal sort of capacity, there's been a lot of discussion about consent and things to actually override that, which is very different from um, some situations where that might go to court because it's a sort of issue about um, surgical treatment or um, life sustaining treatment or whatever. But it's a bit like the original Gillick case where um, if the child was deemed competent, they could be con given contraception against the um, parents' wishes. That's the issue with the vaccine. And, and that is likely to cause um, concern because many of the parents may be in the age group where there is some um, vaccine hesitancy. Thank you very much, Jane. And I think one of the things the CMOs did advise as well was to try and offer information to children and families in a way that enables them to have a healthy uh, discussion at home, just like Habib and I have described uh, what we've had to with our own families is that we don't want this to pull families apart. Um, yeah, the there's, reality, some yeah. Information, there's some information that's on the... Um, of UK yes. uh, website um, and the ones that say they are for I think they're for people with um, more with learning difficulties actually are the appropriate ones they're the ones that are, are very understandable okay. and present the arguments very well well yeah thank you I mean it's 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 not that uh, we're, we're saying that um, every family is going to have the vaccine within the first week of being offered. I think like we have seen with the adults, one of the things we're trying to do is encourage that ongoing um, um, conversation, building of trust, persuading people through giving them information and facts uh, because it's it's going to be continuous as we've seen now with this booster. I'm not saying the children are going to have boosters. I'm not saying that that's been confirmed. I'm just saying that it's a journey uh, that we're on together. And I think one thing we've learned from COVID is that by sticking together and working together, we achieve you know, that longer term good for everybody. Um, if you look at it at the individual level, it becomes really complicated because it's very hard to see the benefit. But I think at population level, which is what we do in public health, that's where we're focusing. And as, you, as Jane said, beyond just the fact that the, the, the CMO looked at the benefits of vaccination versus the harm of the, the impact of COVID on children. They also looked at wider issues like the mental health and keeping education going, the impact of having a year and a half of major disruption to learning. And I mean, even today, the youth champion, some of them talked about concerns that if they didn't get off of the vaccines, they have vulnerable adults in their households that remain at risk of them bringing COVID back home to them. Some teachers are pregnant and have underlying health conditions. Uh, you know, we had a teacher with has asthma, in one of our IMTs the other day, talking about her concern about you know, teaching children who are not vaccinated. I had a quick look whilst Jane was talking. So the studies we looked at, uh, the, the inflammatory disease risk out of a million people uh, vaccinated, I think young people, uh, men aged 12 to 17, about 50 to 60 of them reported uh, had this myocarditis, this rare event in the males compared to under 10, so about eight to 10 females out of 1 million 
that were vaccinated uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. And when you compare that with those who had potential uh, long-term effects on co of COVID, uh, they reckon, again, this was more of a projection on this, because as Jane said, we know younger people don't tend to be hospitalized, but the impact on that was nearly 10,000 cases of COVID and uh, hospitalization was about 180, 180 they reckon. Uh, so these were some of the studies that we shared with uh, our schools and tried to make a case for the evidence for why having the vaccine was far more beneficial. So the risk benefit uh, for vaccination, uh, much better than getting COVID itself and hoping that uh, you, you don't end up in the nearly 10,000 that will most likely uh, develop the longer term complications from COVID-19. Laura, you've got your hand up again on mute and ask your question, please. Hello? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Am, am I allowed to ask the question? Yeah, okay? go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So um, the question for myself is, you've just literally touched on it, but um, for pregnant women um, to have the vaccination, vaccination, the first one or the second one. And um, if somebody asked me, I have a shop and... I, come, I talk to a lot of customers. So if somebody talks to me and says, look, my wife is pregnant, what can I, what can I tell them? Or is there something that you can give me advice to you know, you know, enlighten this subject for myself, just for myself, just to know? Because it, it, if, to me, it feels like it's a gray area. Thank you very much, Nuru. I mean, the pregnancy conversation uh, is a really really a uh, good example or I think for us to, of one where again because of transparency at the beginning when the vaccine vaccines were being rolled out the advice was not to give it to pregnant women yet I'm sure you remember then and and then as more uh, studies were done because they said that then at the uh, initial time that these vaccines had not yet been tested on pregnant women and that was for ethical reasons because as you can imagine they were new vaccines they were still they've been tested already on thousands thousands of people uh, as part of trials but then when they were rolling it out they were first of all targeting the elderly and those who were most at risk at that time from covid and when it's uh, the decision was made to give it to pregnant women after the trials from pregnant for, from trying them on pregnant women were released. It was shown that they were able to reduce the risk of miscarriage. And also, again, this was the problem. They found that with the Delta variant in particular, which is now the main variant, there was a higher risk of hospitalization from COVID. Uh, and I think uh, people were worried about that uh, and felt that pregnant women became more at risk uh, of hospitalization, uh, which you don't want when you're already high risk because you're pregnant and then you, you end up in hospital uh, because you've got COVID-19. So it was then recommended by the Royal College of, like, of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that pregnant women should be offered the vaccine and the decision tree was created. So we can send you the link to that decision tree. And one of the things that we've encouraged those women who are pregnant to do, because pregnancy, as you know, varies from person to person. You might not just be pregnant, but also be high risk pregnancy, especially these days when many people are having children in later life and they have the underlying conditions uh, that put them more at risk. I think the first thing I would do is say to this individual, it's worth having a discussion with the uh, obstetrician and understanding or the GP, understanding the level of risk that this pregnant woman has, because it might not just be the pregnancy, but other underlying conditions that put her at a greater risk. And if she's able to take the vaccine because there's no contraindication at all, then the recommendation is to take the vaccine because it's now been shown with the Delta variant that women are, who are pregnant are more likely to go end up in hospital and need uh, uh, urgent treatment, which you don't really want uh, alongside uh, being pregnant. And I think miscarriage as well, the risk of that increased if you, caught, if you hadn't been vaccinated or you had uh, COVID-19 and your body was not able to fight it. So these are some of the reasons why I think it's worth a pregnant woman thinking about that risk and meeting with the clinician and using that decision tool 
that the Royal College have, have created to have a conversation about their own individual risk and the need to take the vaccine. One other thing that comes up quite a lot with pregnancy is whether the woman works from home or is, you know, works in a high risk environment. Again, it was advised at the time that if you're pregnant and you work in, in care or in a hospital or in a high risk environment where you're most likely to be exposed to COVID-19, it was highly recommended that you take the vaccine and so that you are you know, less likely to develop severe illness, uh, which results in hospitalization from COVID. So I hope that helps. We can definitely, I've seen the links are on there already, but, but I think what we can do is maybe focus some of the content in the newsletter, Habib, maybe next week, yeah. and, and just add some more nuggets there oh. uh, on the get talking section, particularly sure. about what we know about pregnancy and the risk. And you can also then share that decision tool with uh, anybody who needs to make an informed choice about taking the vaccine with pregnancy. Sure, I've, I've put the uh, for no benefit. I've put the um, the the Royal College's link uh, on on there, and I know um, Emily's also put some stuff on there as as well. Thank speaking. you. Yeah, it's also from the Royal you. College as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as as Madhupi said, we will try and obviously these are all guidance and notes. We'll try and localize it and just pull out the key information for yourselves and put some bullet points in um, in the newsletter. Thank you very much. I think one of the things that really encourages us is just seeing that commitment from every, everybody. And we just thank you all very much that, you know, you take your time out to not just come along here and have these conversations, but more importantly, what you do on the ground and trying to understand better yourself so you can better communicate it to other people who might need to hear from yourselves and hear it in a way that, you know, I can't tell it to them as well as you would and they might not trust me as much but you know we really recognize the difference that makes uh, for the communities and one of the things that would really help us is to understand as you've asked you know, what do we need to do to package this information for you in a better format that's easier for you to feed it back uh, to people and to signpost people to help so that's really, really help, helpful as well. We've also looked at maybe possibility of organizing some like mini training sessions or workshop on particular topics, isn't it, Habib? Yeah. Uh, for champions as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank um, you. The, the, the reason, I'll be honest, um, the reason why I have joined um, the community champion is so that, you know, I, I'm, I'm born, bred in Aston, you know, I get to, and there's Lozals, there's Perry Bar, and, you know, end of the day, I've been running my business for 16 years. And before that, I went secondary school, college in the same area. I've gone primary school in the same area. And I've built up a trust. And end of the day, you know, there are, unfortunately, people out there that can't read, that can't write, and they need people like ourselves to help them and give them best advice. And, you know, like, tell them what's going on, because, you know, end of the day, they could have an illness, they could be blind, they could be deaf, they could be anything. And, you know, they come to people like, you know, whoever they come to. And I, I'm quite fortunate in terms of, you know, I've, I've, I've built a big um, database with my community in terms of, you know, people do ask me these kind of questions. And the reason for me, um, COVID is, is, is a topic close to my heart because I've lost a lot of customers, families, friends in this journey. And for me to become a part of this community would be a big bonus because I could work with yourself, I can work with everybody and get the best information. Once I could ed get that information, then I could advise and educate people until I, um, that's the main reason why I have joined this community champion program is so that I could learn. And if you do have any programs going, I'd be more than happy to participate in them. Thank you very much, Nero. I think this is it's so inspiring to hear that. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've really come to appreciate is that it's people like you and others uh, who have taken time out to be part of this journey with us that really are making a difference because there's only so much we can do. You know, uh, we're a small team. Uh, Habib does a fantastic job and everybody, all, all my colleagues on the call to try and pull together information, but we are such a diverse city that, as you say, we can't meet the needs of everybody, uh, be their, yeah, their cultural background or their physical needs, you know, you name it. So it really does help us and, you know, keep 
telling us and bear with us if it's sometimes it feels like it's taking us time to respond to you. Uh, we are trying uh, the best that we can uh, and we really welcome you on board and please share the news with everybody else who you think should be part of this, who is willing to help. Uh, I think the more champions we have, uh, the better to continue to spread the word. Our, our vaccination uptake uh, is still quite low when you compare it to, with the national figures. Our second dose uptake is about 58%, when nationally it's about 82, 83%. So we still have a lot to do uh, to try and um, reach people and understand people better and help them uh, to make those choices. Definitely. Hence why I've joined. I, if I could get those figures up, you know, that's that, that would be good for myself and, you know, for my community as well and any other community. Thank you very much, Nora. And, you're, and you're, you're, the fact that you're, you grew up, as you say, you've got that knowledge is invaluable uh, to us because it, it's, the, it's the journey that you've gone through. As a young person, you would understand some of the challenges that young people face in the communities. Uh, as you know, you, uh, you know, an adult, again, you'll understand some of the challenges that people face and having grown up in a community with uh, the elderly or other people that you've come across, as you say, as part of your involvement in the community really helps us to get that first hand experience of people on the ground and to enable us to shape uh, the the way that we are going to be working with communities going forward. Uh, we've been saying that more than anything, one thing that's really struck us and what we've learned from this whole journey with you all is that the communities are empowered and people do know what they need and people understand and it's how we can uh, change our ways of working in order to work to better fit to the needs of, of communities rather than expecting people to change all the time to adapt to our, our own ways. Uh, I think that's one thing we are learning all the time. Uh, and um, for us here in public health, we recognize all these inequalities and we are trying our best. It might take time, but I think that if we carry on as we are and just having these conversations and working with you all, listening to you, trying our best to make things work for as many people as possible, we'll get there. Uh, and that's what we're it's nice to see you hi <laughs> yeah so thank you so much uh, and we need we need just so as many more people on board especially we recognize not everybody can join these webinars but you know just sending us you got the email address uh, as well uh, and we hope to try and reinstate like a group on our broadcast list on the whatsapp at some point as well uh, we had a bit of trouble with that before well, we'll try and get that going because people said that was much easier uh, than um, emails. So we, we are working on all the feedback uh, that we're getting and we hope to be able to get things uh, improving as time goes on. But welcome, Nero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I'm just conscious of time. Any other questions from anybody else? If there's another question, if we can move on to any other business. Um, I have an ask, um, but I'll wait for everybody else if they've, if anybody else got any other business before I bring my one up. No, from nobody. Okay, I like, my my ask is um we had um we've had a couple of schools contact us from the Brandwood and King's Heath area. So if any of our champions live or have knowledge or got contacts in the King's Heath Brandwood area, the, the concern from the he the heads of the school is that there appears to be quite not quite a lot, but there appears to be uh, children attending school that are either symptomatic or, or, or COVID positive. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pop the, uh, the isolation, uh, stay at home isolation link on there. And, and the ask is basically for you as champions, if you have got contacts in those areas that are just, or those wards that I just mentioned, is to share this information with them and encourage parents to keep their children. We understand it's difficult sometimes where they may be symptomatic, but it looks okay to the eye for children to go into school and parents may be, challenge to keep them at home for work reasons or maybe they can't afford to keep them at home or whatever because they have to be at work and they can't afford to take time off but it's really important if if children are symptomatic or testing positive testing positive, that they, they stay at home simply because obviously if they go into school and you know if the school's got three four hundred kids in there their risk of in infection spreading is really high and 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 we've we already had almost a year of disruption for schools closing and not only just children but obviously staff get it as well uh schools will have to close um, 
and again that will mean more disruption for parents so the ask is really if you could just share i mean i've got the link there the guidance around them what we what else we can do we'll do a little like a, a one a four side of bullet points and we'll share that email that out to you so if you are, if you do live or work or have contact within the brands would kings theory the ask is just to educate and raise awareness of the community there around keeping their children at home or they themselves staying at home if they're symptomatic uh, or if they're testing positive, obviously if they're symptomatic to take a test up until they get the test result to stay at home. That'd be really, really, really good. Someone's asked, I choose to stay off the cold as those symptoms may be COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, the thing is, if they've got a cold, then it's best that they stay at home, but do take a test, take a lateral flow test. If, you, if you're uncomfortable with that, book a PCR test. Once the PCR test result comes back, if it's positive, obviously they'll have to isolate. If it's negative, then then if they're over the cold, then please do send them back into school. I think this is something that is going to come up. Uh, thank you, Habib, uh, yeah. quite often uh, now because we're getting into the cold season. So it's really uh, worth um, us maybe perhaps doing again something in the newsletter about what parents need to do. Uh, about symptoms. I think the schools are very happy to work with parents and help to offer um, material for the children to do from home. I think some schools are still happy to offer some virtual learning. I know it's difficult because every, not everyone has been able to cope with uh, homeschooling and um, all that. Uh, but I think for now, whilst we're still, we're not completely out of the pandemic mode yet. It's important that anybody who has those symptoms um, that they isolate and get a PCR test um, as soon as possible. Sorry, sorry, on that note, um, mm -hmm. I work he heavily with schools um, on my other job, as well as having young children herself. And um, what the understanding we're getting is mixed messages. Um, that's, that's literally being reiterated throughout all the year. So, I'm talking from preschool all the way to year six primary school and parents have there are parents with children that have needed to isolate because of positive not being positive and um you know how you're saying to keep them back and everything it's not an easy call not because of the parents that it's just what the regulation the rules that are changing people are parents are unaware not sure knowing what is the right thing to do and not making sure that they're on the good books with the school as well so i've got uh, responsible parents that did send their child in um, while they're doing a PCR test and everything, and it's come back positive. And so, I mean, luckily for everybody that that child hadn't infected anybody, but that could have easily gone wrong and could have in infected the whole class and, and things like that. Even myself with my younger one, he had a sniffle and everything. I did do a lateral flow test and everything, but still sent him into school. And I was reassured by the nursery key workers, oh, this is a common thing. This, all the children will be going here because they just returned back to school. They're picking up the new viruses, new uh, infections and everything. They need to build their immune system. So, you know, now that I'm getting messages from, from here saying that, you know, take them away from school, get them tested, get them that, but that isn't exactly what the message is coming from school it themselves as well. And this is actually, like you said, grassroots information because I'm there every day receiving this information. So apologies, that's my eight-year-old whinging as well. So you can see here, here that. Um, yeah, so it's not, I don't know. I think that's also needs to be in that message. Um, schools may well need to be re-examined in that sense as well. Maybe the local authority needs to pass on another message to them regarding what they have, you know, what should be taken, what precautions should be. And also, you know, how you said about homeschooling and this is another virtual option, it's not. So a, a friend of mine had to isolate with her child, I think, and she kept on badgering the school, can you send some work? And nothing was sent in the, in the time that she isolated with her child due to a child had to isolate and there was no work sent to him. So in her opinion, her child has fallen behind. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, that's I mean, it's, that's yeah. Really, it's really these are good. very valid. Yeah, yeah. they're mm -hmm. really valid points. Sorry, Medea, but they're really valid no, points. Carry on, and, and unfortunately, it, it, you know, we, we can't both myself and Medea are nodding because we can't disagree. Um, you know, individual, there may be individual staff, or I wouldn't say a school, but there may be individual staff probably misinformed people and the messages are mixed. But we are, you know, point taken, you know, we do work closely um, with all the schools. And there's been several webinars and seminars that um, Medupe and other colleagues 
have invited heads to to share all that information. There's lots, there's lots of information. There's lots of information that's also gone from DFE to actual schools uh, as well. But yeah, we, the message is clear. We will continue to educate. And and in terms of the fact, um, again, different schools operate differently. Some schools have been brilliant. I mean, my my son, as I says, he's 15. He, he spent the best of a year and a half not in school uh, due to COVID. And their school was brilliant. Every single child was given a laptop. Uh, they're really, really, you know, they, they did their schooling from eight o'clock in the morning till three o'clock. So it does differ uh, school to school. I suppose it's a lot more challenging maybe for primary schools. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but it's not an excuse. You know, there really needs to be- Most definitely, yeah. And it's also there's, there's kind of, of where, unfortunately, yeah, and unfortunately what we found is like, where we are, so we're South Solio, and due to because we're not on the people referral and things like that, we're not getting the premium premium um, print. So that's why we weren't entitled to laptops unless you've all got your own. So my son was lucky, or fortunate enough to have his own laptop and thing. But there were parents that there weren't yeah. in that situation. So you know, it doesn't. It does. It was as a primary school student, they'd have missed out heavily, yeah. um, and then continuing to do so. Um, moving forward until this COVID phase passes is over, to be honest. So, yeah, I mean, I appreciate, you know, we, you can, you, you will look into this and everything, but yeah, children are a priority, a key priority in this now um, regarding just not only, not just the vaccination, their education, their mental health, That's and true. even that unsurety, at us being so unsure, what are we portraying to our children as well? We, in fact, parents have all the answers. We don't actually have answers according to them for once we don't have answers and it's not it's just you know unsure and, and as a parent everyone understands how that feels um sure. yeah so that's all yeah so thank you that's all right and carol has put a comment there about the same terms as well you're right carol i mean it does uh, it doesn't help that it's still those three cough temperature and loss of smell and taste. I get this all the time when we have the meetings with the schools describing all these other symptoms that uh, the children tend to have uh, these atypical symptoms and then they test positive. Um, and that's why we hope as much as long as hopefully once we've had more people vaccinated and you know we're in a much better place, you know, even if you've got the odd child with uh, atypical symptoms, well, not odd actually, it's quite common. And uh, somebody coming in not knowing they've got COVID, uh, you know, hopefully the risk uh, will be less. Uh, you know, in the winter months, there'll be less ventilation as well because we'll be closing windows more. So there's just so much to think about. Uh, but we are we are where we are. And I think we've done well to keep uh, the everyone's spirits up and just continuing to encourage people to also do the hand, face, space and ventilation. I think some of these children who don't know they have it to go to school if they can be taught just those simple sneezing into your shoulder, washing your hands, you know, the, the hand and respiratory hygiene. It, it sometimes is these really simple things that really help. I know a friend who four of them in the household, two caught COVID and two didn't just from uh, making sure they were washing their hands. And, uh, and at that time they hadn't even been vaccinated. So I think there is a lot we can do as well uh, to try and keep uh, infection transmission down. Uh, between the children and pairs. Thank you. Thank any you other... so much. Thank you, Habib. No, you're welcome. Any other questions or any other comments from anybody before we close? I'm just conscious it is getting 22 minutes past the allocated hour, but <laughs> but it's been really, really good. It's been a really, really good discussion. Um, you know, we've certainly learned a lot. We're going to take lots away that we need to bring back to yourselves and 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 get you information. So you know, rest assured we'll do that. Um, I'm, hopefully the newsletter will go out first thing tomorrow morning with the dashboard information. That's the only reason why the newsletter has been held back and uh, and then obviously the recording link will go there as well. Any other business or anything else from anybody before we wrap up? If there isn't, I just want to thank everybody for staying on, um, you know, 22 minutes past the allocated hour, 23 minutes past. I just want to thank you all for your hard work and efforts and your endeavours. I just want to thank the the, the colleagues, the champions that have just recently joined as well. Welcome. Um, and, and, and like I said, do, do touch base with me tomorrow and we can have a conversation in terms of how we can better equip you uh, to actually message. Okay, thank you. In your, in, in your respective areas. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Everybody yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Whatever's left of your evening. Uh,
uh, stay safe <laughs> and see no. you all soon. The date of the next, these are fortnightly meetings. The date of the next meeting is, if my maths is correct, I think is the 13th of uh, October, Wednesday the 13th of October uh, at 6 p.m. However, if something, if there is an emergency or something arises that we feel that we need to bring it together, then yeah, you know, we'll- It's not done. It. Don't say it. What's that, Jibba? Oh, sorry, I think it's sorry, you're just happening in the background. Don't share it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, and also, but um, although the meetings are um, fortnightly, please don't wait until the fortnight. If there's any any burning questions or queries that you got, you got my email address. Do email uh, your questions or any queries that you've got. Thanks a lot, colleagues. Take care. Stay safe. See you soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you.